So, assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Coping in Quarantine. We have officially begun the countdown to Eid al-Fitr and hope that this Ramadan has been so fruitful and blessed for you and your families, whether you're watching this live or at a recorded time later. In these last 10 days, you know, we ask you, we ask that you please think of MPAC at the forefront of your charities, but most importantly at the forefront of your du'as, as we are forever appreciative of the community support that we receive. Um, with that in mind, please share with us in the chat box, in the comment section, in on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, some of your traditions during Ramadan. How have you adapted to, to the changes that have occurred? Um, share with us a message of solidarity for those who are celebrating. Um, we here at MPAC continue to be so, so, so moved by our community's ability to come together, even in a time of social distancing, to make a difference through love love and compassion. We hope to uplift these stories on our social media, so please, please feel free to share as you wish. That being said, I am thrilled to introduce our esteemed guests, Lorraine Ellie, a film critic and writer for the LA Times, Kate Harward, the executive producer, and w Walid Zuether, the star of Baghdad Central. We, we at MPAC are so fortunate to have an amazing and capable team devoted to representation and uplifting stories, writers and actors in Hollywood through our Hollywood Bureau. So it is with great, great, great excitement that we bring on today's guests to discuss what will soon be the most binge watch show on Hulu. I, I already know it, write it down, I'm, I'm calling it, um, Baghdad Central. Um, as always, we encourage our audience members to please send in your questions by typing them in the comments comments or the Q&A portion. Um, we will be selecting a few lucky questions um, for our guests to answer, so please do send them in. And with that, I'm going to pass over the mic to MPAC star of the show, uh, Mr. Salam Omariyati and Lorraine Ali to get the conversation started. Thank you, Iman, and you're the real star of everything, so thank you for that handoff. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really pleased to have uh, all of our guests in this conversation. They're all very special people for me and for uh, our organization uh, because it's very difficult to align what we need to do in promoting the truth uh, about um, America's actions in the Muslim uh, world, in the Middle East, um, and, and our values uh, on the one hand with uh, making it uh, entertainment uh, on the other. And I think Baghdad Central did exactly that. And, you know, for me, and I think also I can speak for Lorraine, but I'm sure she's going to say a, a few things as well. We both have roots in uh, Iraq. Uh, and my, my family is from Baghdad. Um, and my, my parents fled uh, in, in 63, uh, the second military coup after 58. And so we know the horror stories of families disappearing, uh, of occupation, of, of war, uh, of what, how a great, great country has simply been uh, drained from its resources, from its greatest resources, which is its people, uh, along with its natural resources, and how oil um, and geopolitics is, has become the instrument of, uh, of destruction uh, in that country. And um, it's done, unfortunately, with our tax dollars as Americans. And so it behooves all Americans to watch this show. Um, and I hope uh, we can gain some more insight uh, from, our, from our discussion. And, uh, and I'm gonna you know, hand it off to Lorraine. And, 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 uh, and she's been a, a, a film critic of many shows. Uh, I read- Television critic. What's that? Television critic, as a matter of fact. Yes, a television critic, a film and television critic, right. And, uh, you know, very distinguished at the Los Angeles Times, and, and she's spoken um, uh, both uh, uh, on panels, conferences, and I believe, you know, various, uh, I see you now on TV, Lorraine, so you've, you've really now uh, become a national voice uh, for, for us as people who are watching these shows as critics as well. But um, Lorraine and I, you know, um, I, I think both believe that this, this show is, is entertaining, is important, um, and, and as a starter for a conversation. Uh, and so I'm gonna let Lorraine go ahead and, 
and start that conversation and, and share her reflections as well. Thank you, Alid and Kate, um, for being here. It's awesome. And the show is wonderful. And I do have a background like Salam, at least my father's from Iraq. I had a lot of family members affected um, by everything that's happened there. And I can say as a person who writes about film, but who's also a television critic, it's really rare that you find something that's not a documentary, that's actually a drama that can tackle it and hit this from all sorts of different sides. And it's so layered. Baghdad Central is so layered and it gets to the society in Iraq and Baghdad in ways that I have never seen another drama at least pointed towards the West or you know Europe do. And so it's a broad question, but when you were going in to tackle this, either of you where you were looking at it like this is so heavy and this is so much like how do we make this into entertainment at the same time well yeah i mean i'm a i'm a drama producer of many many years and uh as a drama producer you spend a lot of time looking for story and looking for source work um and also, you know, you have relationships with certain screenwriters. And Stephen Butchard, who is the screenwriter for this, uh, he and I, many years ago, when I was at the BBC, worked on a show called House of Saddam for HBO and the BBC. And uh, we both felt there were more stories to tell. Um, and when I came across this book, which I came across through a friend who was a publisher, um i felt that you know I, i'm a ca you know a callow tv drama producer you know and i thought good setting uh great central character um and a great premise and i asked Stephen if he was interested uh in in sort of reading the book and coming with us on this journey and he literally said you have me at green zone um, because he felt there were many, many more stories, you know, House of Saddam had done, and, and Walid was in House of Saddam as well, actually, but, you know, he felt there were many more stories to tell, and I think the book, which is written by uh, an American academic who's married to an Iraqi, strong connections with Iraq, um, you know, I think the book is, um, what he gave us was this great central character and a great premise of a, of a sort of um, disgruntled, unhappy, slightly washed up detective. In some ways, it, it's both its connection with the story of Iraq and that particular period of, of Iraq, but also its kind of place in a genre history of novels of disenfranchised detectives working slightly at odds with the society in which they find themselves. So it goes back you know, to, to, to great sort of noir thrillers like like um you know third man or the bernie gunter stories set in berlin the berlin noir the famous berlin noir philip kerr novels so it was both its classicism as a detective story but also its specificity um as a as a fresh world and of course the thing that captivates all of us is that the perspective is unique but it's not worthily unique. I mean, I think that was really important to us as, as drama producers. It's like, it's not wagging a finger or, or you know, Kafaji is not a perfect character by any manner of means. In some ways he's thrown in the towel at the beginning and he has to find his, his mojo and his heart and get it back. And he's, you know, wily and sort of, you know, clever and, you know, at times um, angry and, and quite bitter. You know, he goes through such a range of measures, but it was the character um, and the perspective, I think, that really led us into the story. Um, and we picked it up from, from there. And Stephen, you know, is the, the third man, if you like, on this trio here. He should be here. But, he, you know, he's a great screenwriter. Um, and he's a great character writer. So I think it was those are the ways into it for me. Yeah, I mean, and for me, it was um, just an incredible piece of material. When you look at the novel from Elliot Kola and uh, from Stephen Bouchard, um, everything starts with the writing. And the writing was just exceptional. At first, I, I didn't think so. I was just in a very different headspace. And I got to say a little bit jaded 
about some of the roles uh, been getting here out of the U.S. and Hollywood um, and not being seen for the roles that I wanted to be seen for. And when I removed that negative filter, because I was very skeptical when I first read it, but when I removed that filter, I really saw that this was so layered, so beautiful, so uh, heroic of a journey of somebody who is really, when we first see him, he's, you know, he's at, you know, he's at his, uh, his wit's end and he's given up on life. And then it's just this, um, so it, it's, it, for me, it was how you kind of combined a world that I was very familiar with, but to give it so much uh, dignity and, um, the, the just the truly beautiful voice that it needs to have and, and the kind of production quality uh, that we were getting and with the writing and the casting, it, it wound up being like very, very nuanced. And I even saw the nuance in the writing. So if you look at the show, it's not like anything happens that is a real, real surprise, you know, in terms, you know, to tie into what some of Kate was saying is that there's there's some elements in there that we're familiar with but i think what makes our show unique is that it's it's how it's the the way in which these characters react to circumstances and tragedy and and being you know uh, uh handcuffed literally and figuratively and backed into a corner um they, they just did an incredible job with the casting kate Rhodes james our casting director and they cast really some of the best talent out of the Middle East. We had an incredible uh, dialect coach, but also we, uh, our associate producer, Arij Al-Sultan, who is Iraqi and a filmmaker herself, uh, was very instrumental in, you know, in the small details to the bigger uh, uh, details. You know, when we were talking about just, for example, the the uh, the files that they have on the whole population. I mean, the kind of information that we were getting from Arij, just in conversations, you know, different, you know, during the the shoot for three months, were just very uh, very eye opening and and just really grounded everything, made it very very real. Um, I think also, if I could add that, that yeah, I just I, I, from from a viewer standpoint, I appreciated also how women played a um, a, a prominent role in the story from your daughters to the woman professor to even the, the woman working uh, for the coalition authority in, in those offices. So it, it, it gave us uh, a more realistic understanding uh, of, uh, of the people. And it gave, to me, that was a way of giving a human face to the Iraqi people and to the situation in Iraq. And I really appreciated that. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I got to say, I mean, you know, it starts with the writing, but the casting was very important, too. I remember uh, the role of uh, Zahra that's played by Maysa Abdul Hadi, very talented Palestinian actress. She was like, I don't like where this character is going. And she had a great conversation with Alice Troughton, our main director, and Alice changed uh, that. You know, she was like, OK, you she, uh, what Mesa's uh, interest was, she didn't want the character to be a victim. She wanted her to be strong and powerful. And, and, and without that conversation happening and the kind of collaboration that we have as, as artists uh, and the right people, you know, that had the same goal, uh, then, you know, we wouldn't have had the kind of quality. I, was I think that we could just back up for one second and just, I'm um, sorry, Kate. It's hard to no, do no, this don't, without don't. the video. But just if you're going to just encapsulate like what the series is about when you're just, somebody says, what is it about? Like in a few sentences, because we kind of just jumped in, but it'd be kind of nice to back up for one second and. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I would say, I, I would say it's, it's a, you know, a, in some ways a classic detective, a noir thriller with a, with a, a shifted perspective um, on a period we think we know very well which is the uh, coalition occupation of Iraq in 2003, but the perspective is split. So you're seeing it from the point of view uh, of an Iraqi and, and the, the, the family at jeopardy are his family and the opposition, the other, if you like, uh, are the Americans and the British, the uh, invading coalition. Um, and I think 
so often we've gone in with the with the kind of coalition western perspective where the iraqi or you know is the other and and the and the american british whatever whoever it is the invading force becomes the subject in this case they're not the subject the subject is the iraqi and even though you know, we can talk about language later. We had a lot of discussions about whether to make it fully dual language or whether to sort of locate it in English language and move out into, into a mixture of English and Arabic. Um, you know, the perspective was always Kafaji. Kafaji made, there's very few scenes without him in it. There's very few scenes where it where it's not loaded in his perspective. And, and Alice, our director, who we keep referring to, uh, you know, when we said, you know, I'm sure the budget should be this, but unfortunately it's this. She said, it doesn't matter because this is an epic. This is not an epic show. This is a show about one man's view of his shifting universe and his shifting world and his shifting alliances and balancing the needs and his, his affection for two daughters, you know, and trying to kind of look after them both when one is running ahead of him and one can barely keep up, you know, and it's a sort of, you know, that, that is what grounded us all the time, is what would Kafaji do? Where is he gonna go next? Who's he, who's he talking to? So that's not a few sentences, I appreciate that's quite a lot. But no, no. That is really what it's about. It's a very character driven, and Stephen's a very character driven writer. Um, and we were, you know, incredibly lucky to have Waleed giving us that charisma and, and strength at the center of it, uh, and to give us Kafaji. And uh, Walid, I was going to ask you, you, this is not the first time, if, if I remember correctly in Omar, didn't you also play a, was he an inspector or a... Um, he was uh, an Israeli uh, police officer or, um, um, uh, I forget the exact term, uh, uh, sorry, blanking. It's I, okay. A, yeah, but uh, uh, Mossad agent or uh, Shin Bet, sorry. But the difference, what I, the reason I ask is because when I watch Baghdad Central, I love it that you can move between these cultures. They're sometimes very at odds with each other and play a similar character that's not similar. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like you brought to, um, this character in Baghdad Central is something very different, but also the idea he, he has so much baggage and so much history of dealing with this corrupt society, but also dealing with corrupt forces coming in. So I don't know. I don't know how you get in the headspace to kind of navigate these different worlds that are not your own. I suppose that's part of being a performer, but you also do it so convincingly. Well, thank you. It's, it's really exciting. Honestly, that's where the most fun I have in my work. It's really, um, there's a couple of things. One, I've learned that the more I do this as an actor, the more I bring from myself and what I'm experiencing in that time, which I have no control over, as none of us do, uh, bringing that to the role. So I've learned, especially over the past five years or so, that it, it's, it does me more good than, than harm to do that. And there was no difference here. The, the other thing too is like, the, the interesting thing with Omar is that, um, I, I'm, I'm, and that's why I was so drawn to Stephen's work. Stephen is, is a humanist. He writes beautifully for characters and and so uh, there were even times when I was reading it and I, I was um, uh, a little bit, <laughs> I told Stephen this one point, I was like, I was a little annoyed how much detail you had in the subtext and the parentheticals because it was like, well, let me make those choices. But, but it was, it was in, a, in a good way because he was always right on target. So it was this kind of push pull, even when I first read it uh, mm -hmm. uh, on tape, I was like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> but he was so right. So instantly I had a trust in this guy as a writer who understands this character, this guy. Um, it's also like the other choice could have been is to play off of some of the stereotypes that are real and to kind of be the kind of father that the world expects an Arab male to be. Uh, and I chose to take a completely opposite 
direction to that and probably something closer to, to me. And I just imagined what would, ha what would I, how would I behave if my wife died of cancer, couldn't get treatment because of sanctions, my oldest son was killed as a dissident and with these two daughters, what would I do? And the answer was, I, I would, you know, crawl in a hole. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, well, you know, it's an interesting place to start. And so it gives you more of a journey, it gives you more of a journey, more excitement, you know, for, for from a creative standpoint. And then, um, and I, I brought tons of my own life to that. And I was able to really relate to that. Um, but like with Omar, for example, I was playing in Israeli. And same goal, I wanted to humanize. Uh, and being a Palestinian myself, I wanted so much to humanize this character for a, a number of reasons. One, personally, I think when you, once you step into somebody else's shoes, you learn more. You know, you can learn a lot by speaking to people who agree with you and are in the same, you know, bubble or pool or whatever. But I think we only advance as humanity when you're speaking to people that are actually at odds with you, okay? And when a lot of Arab actors uh, wouldn't, wouldn't do that, um, that was something that was very important to me. So, so just in terms of humanizing an Israeli character who could be the villain or the antagonist in something, but giving them those layers, it just makes it more real. It makes it more, um, I think, you know, um, you're, 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 you're respecting your audience more. You're giving them more respect that they can follow along and appreciate the authenticity that you're bringing. So it's a combination of so many things. And um, Salami, you just have to tell me to shut up whenever you need me to, to oh, no. stop. No, but no. Uh, <laughs> where did you shoot? Because you recreated, Baghdad's recreated, so. It's Morocco. Ah. It's Morocco. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, we shot mainly uh, in Wazazat, which is the big film town of Morocco. I think there are five studios there, and there were so much films there. Um, and uh, in Rabat and Salah and Mohamedia. Um, and the Moroccan film crews are so great. They're so experienced. You know, there's a, there's a filmmaking history that goes back to, you know, the 1940s. Um, and uh, in fact, I was watching a film the other day and I suddenly, it was, um, oh, I can't remember completely exactly what it was, but it was a 1970s film with Sean Connery and, and uh, Michael Caine, um, The Man Who Would Be King. I was watching it and I went, oh my God, look, this, what was that? I, see the same, I just don't recognize the oasis behind our studio. So, I mean, they've been making films there since forever. Um, and uh, the, the great thing, as I said earlier, about perspective, we didn't feel we had to kind of stand back and give this huge vista of a city, but uh, we had to, you know, we had to give a city and actually most films that try and represent Iraq often end up you know, shooting battles in deserts. It was more important to us. I mean, the green zone was a, was a, was a difficult one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the Baghdad itself around the streets where Khalaji lives, that Morocco was, was fine for that. I mean, we, we often said we had to, we, we didn't do a massive amount of CGI. We basically took the Atlas Mountains out put the river in. That was the two big things we had to do. Turn the buildings from sort of pinkish to brownish. Um, and, you know, everything else was assembled on the ground, really. We had a really talented production designer, a lot of local sporting artists. And as, as Waleed said, our cast came from the Middle East and diaspora, really. Uh, there were about five Iraqis in the cast um, at different at different roles, um, a lot of, of British Arab actors, um, a lot of Palestinians from all over the world. Really, I mean, you know, the the biggest headache filming in Morocco. I'm not going to lie, was visas. That was a nightmare. You know, it was always a bit of a. You'd start at the top of the week and you go, who could we manage to get in by Wednesday? And if we couldn't get them in by Wednesday, we'll have to change the schedule around. You know, it was a that was the toughest thing. It's just so many people flying in from so many places, but, uh, but Morocco, it was all Morocco. 
and I think, uh, you know, uh, the Americans that were casted, uh, the one who played the military police uh, officer. Curry. Curry yeah, Stoll. He, he played uh, a congressman in House of Cards. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he played a journalist, didn't he, in House of Cards? No, I think Is he was he a journalist. Uh, the congressman, uh, I forget his name now. I oh, know you're right. Yeah, he was a congressman. Yeah, yeah he was. So yeah. that, that was an interesting, I, that was an interesting. And he's coming up in Billions soon, I think, in the new series of Billions. Yep. Yeah. Is this Corey Stahl? Because he's in everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. it's... Okay, well, shows how much I don't know. <laughs> he's great. He's a good bad guy. Yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he did a pretty good job. I think he came across, uh, you know, somewhat compassionate for a military guy. And I mean, I felt like it, the, the story kind of let the U.S. off the hook a little bit. That, you know, well, don't forget, in the book, was... in the book, <laughs> Uh, Citroen, well, the Brits always play the bad guys, we don't mind really. We always <laughs> James Mason onwards, you know, it's just always the Brits as the bad guys. But in the book, the character that Bertie Carvel plays, um, uh, Temple is actually American, we just turned him British, so uh, he, he's not let off the hook in the book, but we 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 made him British. Um, I think I don't think the system's let off the hook. Um, you know, a great, a lot of, a book that all of us read actually was um, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, uh, which is an amazing piece of reportage um, from a journalist, an American, um, a journalist who's embedded with the American military. And it is, it's the most staggering piece of uh, close up analysis of the most incredible mismanagement. Um, and you know the the, the idea that that uh, you know which everybody has always said they won the war and lost the peace you know that, that nobody nobody took care of the civilian population at all um, and nobody thought beyond uh, toppling Saddam and there are so many brilliant little bits of anecdotes in in that book and other books that we read that we that we felt that don't um, shine a great light on, on, on what happened but I think you know to say that all Americans who turned up were there for the wrong reasons I think was would be too simplistic and Parodi is a character in the book who you know has a slightly more sanguine view of what he's doing there so that that's that's what we brought to it I think. Uh, the, the other the other uh, observation I had that was also to me a you know very uh, illuminating was when uh, Mohsen uh, is talking uh, to his uh, brother-in-law and who were actually, you know, collaborators uh, in, in, and led to the uh, death of, uh, of Mohsen's son. And, and in that moment, I felt like this was an epiphany for me uh, as, as someone with roots in Iraq and, and family from Iraq, that we're all to blame uh, for what happened. We should stop this cycle of violence by, you know, just taking out vengeance uh, on those who did this or did that, that we're really, you know, that I think that was the message. And I thought that was a very powerful message that we're, we're all victims and we're all uh, villains at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully you didn't spoil this for viewers. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> hopefully, it's more of a, hopefully it's more of a teaser. Hopefully Good. it's more of a teaser. <laughs> I've been afraid but to I say anything. That. I love that moment, though, that, you know, Kharji shows real anger. I thought that was <coughs> so that while he'd never softened the character, you know, he, he always, when, when Kharji needed to find anger, you found, you know, the most real fury sometimes. And that, that's a great moment of, a, yeah. of anger we're all to blame, you know, of, of insight, too, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Corey, and and I gotta say, that um, both Corey. Like we kind of touched on this earlier, but oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there was just a bit of a delay. I was just I was just saying about Corey Stoll. One of my nice moments uh, in, in the show was both Corey and Bertie Carvel. Uh, within ten minutes of meeting both of them, they both said to me. The same thing. It's like you know, you, you know how important this project is, right? And 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 I I just loved hearing that from them because they they knew how important it was, and and you know Corey, 
you know, like you, you said, he, he's constantly working. He can have his pick of, of roles. He, he had a conversation with Steven and, you know, talked about what the rest of the season, you know, the season was going to look like. Um, so I just, I, I'm just very proud of, of, you know, both of those guys. You know, we, when we were talking earlier about, um, yes, this is really <coughs> important and it is a, it's a, it's an important story and it's a, a geopolitical mess as well that it's set in. Um, but it's also a detective story. So I guess how important was it for this um, series to, how do I say this, to kind of give a humanitarian view of the whole situation in Baghdad post Saddam, but also you have to keep it a drama and entertaining. So in other words, like, was it hard to keep that balance, I guess? Was it hard to kind of move between those two things or did they, or was it like, okay, we can bring people through this political mess through this fictional story? I think um, the great thing about detective drama, and I love detective shows, um, is that they're a fantastic vehicle for ideas, you know, and uh, if, if you're telling a good detective story, the ideas and the characters come too, and they expand and they contract depending on, on the, you know, whether you're doing pure procedural or whether you're doing a character driven piece like, like this. And uh, you know, detective stories give you license to kind of kick the door down in people's lives and find out truths, you know, and, um, you know, we, we often said that, uh, you know, you set a detective story in Baghdad in 2003, Jeopardy is everywhere. I mean, you, you only have to step outside your front door and a tank can mow you down or a Humvee can mow you down or you get shot or whatever. So the battleground, the obstacles that you're throwing at your lead characters are just you know, endless. Um, so I think the only thing uh, Channel 4 said at the beginning to us, don't let it get too wary, um, which is a really not very elegant way of saying, you know, d we don't want too many soldiers bursting in with guns, you know, and, and that was a good, it was a good basic note, um, but it never really, it would, we'd have gone on to the wrong track, I think, if it had done. Uh, because the POV wasn't the soldiers and the army and the, and the fighting. The, the POV was someone trying to pick their way through the ruins to get to a truth. And, you know, the, dete you know, the key moment, the detective, they're all looking at around with guns. The, the detective is looking at the ground and picking up a stray bullet and putting it in his pocket. You know, that's, that's the eye of a detective. So I, I think in my kind of cold producer heart, I think it's just a great setting for a detective show and keep your eye on the prize and the key, and the key character because the ideas the world you if you represent it truthfully they'll come to you know but that wasn't the the governing thing was not to make a sort of finger wagging destiny show yeah i think for me there were s <laughs> images that were uh so uh powerful that were just a couple of seconds you know like the there's an image in the first episode of the horse getting, you know, uh, run over by the um, the Humvee, and that, you know, that says so much. That's and that's, uh, um, you know, and then you you go back to the characters. Was there was there? Um, uh, I remember there was something about the horse, Kate. But was that ever an an issue um, for us to to do that, or wasn't it like we actually have records of something like that actually happening in Iraq, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the horse wasn't the horse wasn't hurt. You know, the horse was had a nice day out, <laughs> and then was it was a bunch of pixels that was kind of spread all over the road. But you know, it it, it, it was always an image. Uh, it was an image that that matters a lot to Stephen. Actually, it came completely from Stephen. It was like, it you know, how do you take something precious and beautiful and essentially kind of free and smash it thoughtlessly? Um, and you know, it was it was it was in there the first the first third of the script um, when we read it, and it stayed there and it stayed there and it stayed there. You know, it was always kind of important to us to make that bit that well, metaphor. I, 
It's not a heavily metaphoric piece, but it, that was a metaphor. Well, uh, and also I've had Iraqis tell <laughs> me that that scene in particular made it very authentic because they've, they've told stories about things like that happening. Mm -hmm. mm. So it, it did bring uh, a, a reality and authenticity to the story. Yeah, I, I thought so too. I, I thought we captured the, the lawlessness of that time. And, and that's, what, that's what that felt like. Um, by the way, I don't know if you know this, Salam, but I was in Kuwait when Iraq invaded. In, uh, and so in 80, uh, sorry, 90. 91. And, uh, 91. <laughs> and um, so a lot of this stuff was also very familiar to me in terms of just what happens when an invasion happens, displacement, when nobody is giving, you know, instructions. You know, the first rule of war is when you occupy a place, you take over their, their uh, radio station and you tell the people and, you know, what to do. And I was in Kuwait when that happened. And, and you know, it, so there was, there was real chaos. And that, for me and for other actors in the cast that, experienced diaspora displacement, it was very, very real. You know, uh, the Secretary of Defense at that time, uh, I'm forgetting his name, but I remember what he said when there were stories about looting and, you know, lawlessness, and he goes, well, that's part of democracy. You know, people are now free enough to go and steal and well, and you know what Rumsfeld it's that kind of right? That kind of madness that we're all in here in, in the United States. Well, there was a, a play I did at the public theater called Stuff Happens, which is David Hare's play uh, from, from the UK, and we brought it to uh, New York. In the UK, the main character was, was um, uh, Tony Blair, and in our production, it was uh, Powell. Mm -hmm. and, um, but basically, the name of the play was Stuff Happens, and that was you know softening what uh, Rumsfeld said, which was another word. <laughs> Rumsfeld, that's the guy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Walid, can I ask you one other thing? I, you brought up um, um, that you had had some kind of burnout or maybe were not super satisfied with some of the roles you were being offered or that came your way. Can you be more specific about like what you were seeing and why this role was kind of s such a different role for you? Um, in general, I would uh, get stuff like, you know, the good Arab, um, which we're seeing more. Um, and I've just, you know, I've, it doesn't do anything for me as an actor. It doesn't um, stretch my imagination or challenge me. And so I, I just kind of felt myself that I was almost, I felt like I was recycling roles. I was playing roles with an accent or... <clears throat> Sometimes I get lucky enough and, oh, this guy doesn't have an accent, but he's got, you know, ties to terrorism or something else. And I was like, enough, you know, that's, that's, that's it. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to, I, I mean, I, I've come a few times in my career where I was actually considering quitting, uh, not for that specific reason, but it was just, you know, it's, I need an opportunity to kind of show what I can do. And with the character like Khafaji and the fact that he is Arab, which I'm very proud of. It's like, that's like, you know, both dreams coming true for me. So I was able to really let him breathe and just discover what I, you know, think I'm capable of, but nobody's really given me a chance before now. So, um, you know, I, I hope it leads to other, uh, roles like this, and not just for me, but for Middle Eastern actors in general. I mean, that's why I went blonde. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 but um, no, this was strictly Corona being at home and, you know, not getting a haircut and stuff. And <laughs> the only chance as an, an actor, I get to control what I look like because no, we're not filming anytime soon. <laughs> Maybe I'll go blonde next. <laughs> it's an well, option. I used to have short hair, so I don't know. Uh, Lori, I think Iman has some audience questions. Uh, you can allow her to share one or two questions from the audience. Sure. Iman? 
Absolutely, yeah, it seems to be popping. So um, one, of the, one of the big questions is actually about the book um, itself. Um, and it says, you know, prior to becoming a TV series, but God Central was a book. Um, Kate, can you think, um, Kate, when, you, when adapting the book into a TV series, what drew you most to the story? And why do you think this mes messaging is something that needs to be shared across multiple um, platforms? So we already have a book. Why, why was it so necessary to be a TV show as well? Oh, because I'm a magpie. I go and try and find, I mean, my job is TV. I go and find TV shows where I, you know, where I read a good book. And as I said earlier, you know, it was the character and the premise. You know, it was the point of view and the character himself. And, you know, in the book, we, and we, we touch quite lightly on his poetry loving and his, uh, you know, and his kind of slightly world weary view. The po po poetry loving, we love all the moments of poetry. In the book, there's a lot of poetry he, because that's Eliot's um, speciality. So he dropped huge sort of chunks of poems in, but we, we touched it in quite lightly. But it was a beautiful idea that there was a man who would, you know, in the midst of it all, just stop and kind of come up with a poem or remember a poem or quote a poem. Um, and there's a lovely bit when he's, um, the interpreter's listening to him and uh, and he's in, he's um, he's questioning someone, the interpreter's going back into English and then just goes, he's saying a poem. And the American goes, what? <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> so, so it was those lovely character traits, I think. Um, and then you, and it's just a fresh perspective on, on a, on the world and, and uh, you know, in a fresh way of telling a story. So speaking of that perspective, you know, how do you think that it's been received by audiences in the United States, um, even, even globally? How, how do you see this kind of shifting perspective um, of, of, of individuals watching? Well, it's interesting. We're about to announce actually uh, uh, next week. I think uh, it, it's been it's been sold to a massive a amount of territories. A lot of people have have picked it up, um, and you know it's obviously great. These days, you can follow on Twitter who's seeing it and you know what their views are. And I think you know I'm sure Wally and I every morning go, oh, who watched it last night? Where and what are they saying? And and you know it's it's had. It's had amazing feedback, very personal feedback, actually. Uh, when it was going out on Channel 4, we found, you know, not just Iraqis. I mean, Iraqis were seeing it quite quickly in Iraq, which we weren't quite sure how, but anyway, they were. But the, the feedback was coming back, and it was very personal. It was reminiscence, and, you know, I remember uh, uh, actually somebody who was with the coalition, a British Army officer, saying, it's so, it feels so truthful, it feels so authentic, except the toilets are much nicer than they were in the green zone when we were there. <laughs> Everything else looks completely different. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's clearly resonated, it, it, yeah. you know, and that's, that's lovely. That, that really means a lot. Yeah, I've, I've heard directly from a lot of Iraqis on social media, and they're just uh, uh, so ecstatic and very uh, proud that somebody's telling their story. And uh, just been an outpouring of, of people, you know, saying how much they love the show and, and, and how uh, just, you know, w well made it is, you know, and how entertaining and everything. Can I, can I jump in, Emily? I just want to ask the three, uh, including Lor uh, Lorraine. Um, so in shows like this, you're thinking about audiences. And so there's the Western audience. Then there's the global audience. There's the Middle East audience. There are other audiences. What were you thinking um, in terms of you know what audience you're, you're you're trying to sell this to and and Lorraine as a as a critic how do you see it in terms of you know its entertainment value here in the in the in the West versus what you have uh, you know you've traveled around the world and how uh, uh, other audiences uh, would view this show who do you want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Lorraine. <laughs> I'll just be quick. Um, I would say, you know, when I watched it, I thought what was brilliant about it is exactly what we're talking about. It, it's a detective story, so therefore it's kind of universal. It's a story that, like, you're, you're, you're pulled through, and this he's a family man, and he has kids, and you're pulled through by these 
really common factors that we all have. But then in the background, you're pulled through a war zone, you're pulled, you know, or post Saddam. So I thought it would appeal to many audiences on some of the same levels, but then also hit different um, things that they were familiar with on different levels, if that makes sense. I thought that was the brilliance of it, that it's very global, it's very universal in the many themes that it tackles. Beautiful. Um, Kate, I mean, w when, when you guys made the show, you made it for the UK audience, right? For the Channel 4, I mean, there, I'm sure Channel 4 had certain uh, parameters for you guys, right? Well, I mean, you know, the British TV audience brought up, I think, on public service broadcasting um, in, you know, over, over decades are, are quite a sophisticated mainstream audience. You know, they, the mainstream TV in the UK for many decades has been equivalent, I think, to cable or now, as you know, sophisticated escort. It's a quite a sophisticated audience, the, the UK audience. And uh, so, but even so, it was quite a bold ask, I think. You know, dual language is not, uh, it, it's quite a new thing. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the Channel 4, I mean, they had every right, they were the commissioning broadcaster, you know, through talking to them, you know, they wanted to make sure that the Brits didn't feel they were watching an acquisition, which did TV talk for saying something yeah. that's bought in, you know. Um, so I think putting characters like Bertie Carvel's character Temple in there helped to kind of root a British perspective. But other than that, you know, I think we felt we were well in Iraq up to our necks, you know, the Brits and, you know, we had to kind of own all of that and, and own that kind of, own it in the round. But, you know, Wally and I had a great time, but it was probably the last time I left the country and probably will be the last time I leave the country for some time. But we had a great time in launching it in, in Stars Play, uh, Arabia, in Dubai. Um, and the show has done brilliantly in the, you know, in the MENA, the Middle East, North, North African territories, as one would expect, but we didn't take that for granted, did we, Waleed, and it, at all, and actually it was really fun launching it there, and, and the feedback from Stars Play Arabia, and Stars Play Pakistan, actually, uh, and the MENA territories has been phenomenal, um, and constant, um, and the enthusiasm, and it's been one of their most successful shows, so, that was, as I say, we did not take that for granted, and it's been a delight, really yeah. has. And you know, they released it as an original, which says a lot. It says that this is their voice, and that they're very proud of it, and they want to promote it. Um, and so, I, I, you know, we were very moved by that. I think, you know, mm -hmm. to be totally honest, one of the things that we had talked about when we were making the show was how important this was for, a, uh, for an American audience. And 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 what? Why I personally liked Corey's character. One, I'm a big fan of Corey, and so the casting was great because he is a <laughs> likable guy. But I thought it was smart that the American character is conflicted, and I thought that that's where there's room for for Khafaji and Parodi to to have some kind of a relationship and a push and pull there, because uh, more, uh, Parodi has a very strong moral center as does Khafaji. And when he sees that in Parodi, there's, you know, it kind of draws it out in him a little bit. So uh, I just wish that, you know, um, and that's one of the reasons why we want to do this is promote the show is, you know, Hulu acquired it as a straight license deal. So it's not a Hulu original. So we're hoping that they, you know, realize how, how strong of a show that they have and, and, you know, that it'll get the audience it deserves. But but you know, it's important for us to to get this story to to American audiences. We're hoping for the uh, one of the COVID dividends. You know, people mm. stuck at home <laughs> looking for good drama. <laughs> you know, so we we got to grab the dividend where we can find them, and we're hoping that you know, it certainly uh, it certainly helps sales of these shows because audiences are you know they're running through content fast and uh, and finish shows that that. Um, you know, maybe wouldn't have found a home, have found homes. So as I say, we're doing a big announcement next week to say how many territories this is sold into, which is great. You know. 
Great. I can, I can most certainly tell you from my experience that this show has become very popular in all the WhatsApp chats that I've 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 been a part of. So right? that's how the popularity <laughs> begins. Let me tell you. So, um, oh, brilliant. I, I want to <laughs> ask now. I, I want to ask now the the question that seems to be popping up the most. Um, at, is that should we be expecting a second season and when? Well, you know, the second season, everything's on hold at mm -hmm. the moment in drama commissioning and development. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, when we can shoot something is, you know, we, we, I mean, I'm talking to friends and producer friends today and, you know, friends who've got, two episodes left of something to shoot and they didn't even know when they're going to pick that up. Mm. Um, but all we know is that, uh, you know, the, and also the broadcasters are, you know, it's tough, it's tough with the ad revenues dropping and all of that, but we know there are plenty more stories to tell. Um, I have this slightly glib response when I'm asked this, which is, you know, my, one of the, one of the anecdotes I remember from um, Imperial Life in the Emerald City is that when the Americans, the amount of the amount of dollars, box fresh dollars that were taken into Iraq um, on pallets, and when the Americans handed back to or the coalitions, I should say, back to the Iraqis, there were 2.5 billion dollars unaccounted for. Um, and where there's money, there's crime, and where there's crime, there's crime drama. You know, <laughs> there's plenty of stories. So uh, we're, we're, you know, we can do more. I'm happy to. On, on our end, Kate, we, uh, we speak, we write a lot of letters to Congress advocating for, for a lot of things. So we'll have to write a letter to Hulu, making sure that they prioritize your season as the first thing that goes back into filming, because I know my household can't wait, wait even a week. Oh, that's so good of you. That's so kind. <laughs> Um, but thank I do you. want to thank thank all of our guests for joining us um, so, so humbly. Um, but, uh, I think Walid was going to say one last thing. Oh, yeah, please, please. Sorry, was I? Was I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you always can. Um, well, just that, you know, I mean, I, for one, would love to have a second season. Kate knows this. And, um, I mean, you know, everybody, I think, involved in the Me show too. would love to have a, yeah, exactly. Kate does. Everybody involved in the show would love to have uh, a second season. So, you know, what we really want to focus on right now, just making sure that as many people get to see the first season, because, you know, when things kind of go back to normal and how that is, that would be really, I think, the deciding factor, which would, or one of the deciding factors, I'm sure it comes down to money and all other things. But, it, but you know, if there's such a, a demand for it, if there isn't a second season, at least there'll be other things like it in that same universe, which, I mean, look, the, the Middle East market for content is at one billion right now, and it's going to triple in the next five years. So mm -hmm. the demand for content in the Middle East is huge. The stories we have are, you know, unlimited. I mean, it's a very complex part of the world. We have so many things going on, stuff that we're proud of, stuff that we're not. And there's just such a, uh, an opportunity there. Um, the only thing I, I, I would share with you and your viewers is that my wife and I, Joanna, and a couple of partners, we set up a company, and our whole mission is to, to do just this. To, you know, if we, you know, if Baghdad Central was on our slate, uh, it, it falls squarely within our mission statement, which is to amplify the voice of underrepresented and historically misrepresented voices around the world. So, um, uh, you know, we're committed to telling these kinds of stories. We're committed to whatever we can do to have a, a second season or, you know, like shows. Well, we're going to see you at the next Media Awards whenever we can have that. If you ever do a project about Pakistan or Kashmir, please, you have a lead role right here. My mom says I'm very dramatic. I'd be happy to help in any way. But uh, uh, Iman, I just also, uh, Lorraine, did you have any closing thoughts? No, just like, you know, thank you for talking about this. And I, you know, it's really interesting to kind of hear your perspectives on it in the background, because it's such a, it's such a, um, great, detailed, entertaining, heavy 
and also just I don't know it's a it's a wonderful series and I, I say this as a TV oh, critic as someone who is bombarded with stuff all the time and this is something if I was not a TV critic I would sit down and watch anyway so like thank you for being here to talk about it because it's really interesting to get your perspectives on it thank you well, thank you very much for that thank you that's thank you lovely all. to hear thank you so much thank you okay back to you man yeah, well, we're going to wrap up our webinar, which again was brought to us by the wonderful, wonderful Miss Sue Abebe. She pitched this idea and it was such an easily uh, grasped and excited project that we decided to take on. Sue, uh, for those who don't know, heads our Hollywood Bureau, which I mentioned earlier as um, being very involved in the representation and projects in, in Hollywood. Um, so we're really excited and lucky to have her. Um, thank you again to all of our guests um, for joining us. It has been such an informative webinar and we are so excited to see uh, all the future projects that, that come out of this. Um, as always, I hope that our viewers learned as well. And if you are interested in future webinars, please make sure to go to www.mpac.org forward slash webinars for information on all of our upcoming webinars. Um, and as always, if you have any insight on future webinars that we should do, email us at hello at mpac.org. It goes directly to me and I'm always on my phone, so I'm quick to respond. Um, thank you again to everyone and have a blessed last few days of Ramadan and a blessed evening. Thank you so much. You. Ramadan Kareem to everybody. You. Ramadan Kareem. Thank you, Walid. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Wassalam. Uh,